Uh, thank you very much for joining uh, uh, on the session for COVID-19 air quality and health issues. Uh, this is part of the session on our annual sustainable development conference, which is 23rd this time. And what the very first time we have moved to a virtual platform because of COVID-19. Um, I'll start by telling some of the housekeepings. This session would be live at our Facebook page, STTV Pakistan. And it will also be live broadcast at uh, our executive director's Facebook page, Dr. Abid Bayum um, We are using hashtag STC2020 for this. So uh, those of you who are tweeting, please do this, uh, use this hashtag. Um, COVID-19 has uh, locked on the world, which has uh, consequently reduced air emissions and improved air quality around the globe. This is what uh, research says, uh, uh, which was conducted in 2020 by uh, some of the authors. And one of the studies compared that the uh, nitrogen dioxide pollution by, uh, has been reduced by an average of 40% across China and 20 to 38% across Western Europe and the USA. Uh, this was cited by uh, American uh, Geophysical Union 2020. Uh, and another research uh, study showed that lockdowns in Europe have played an important role in reducing mortality rate caused by air pollution with 11,000 fever deaths in the region. And we do know that why uh, these stats are showing this because during lockdowns, industries were closed and air pollution was a bit better during that time. Uh, transportation was uh, not operational. So we didn't have transportation emissions as well. Um, I have been joined by to speak on this uh, COVID-19 in relation with uh, air quality and health issues. Uh, I have on my uh, panel Dr. Gabriel Filippil, uh, Filippili, and correct me if I'm pronouncing right, uh, who is Chancellor's Professor, Director of the Center for Urban Health, Indianapolis, Indianapolis. Uh, University USA. Uh, very good morning, Dr. Gabriel. Uh, it is 7.30 uh, in USA. Uh, then we have uh, Mr. Abid Amar, who is founder of Pakistan Air Quality Initiative, uh, uh, Pakistan, who is providing, who is a private data provider uh, and founder of uh, Paki. Uh, we have been joined by Ms. Bharati Chaturvadi, who is director of Chintan, New Delhi, India. And uh, then we have Ms. Farzana Altaf Shah, who is Director General, uh, Federal Environmental Protection Agency, Pakistan, which will be representing a uh, governmental point of view. Later on, we will be joined by, uh, for special remarks, we will be joined by Mr. Muhammad Irfan Tari, who is Director General, Environment and Climate Change from Ministry of Climate Change, to know that uh, what really uh, uh, are they taking measures in, in relation with environment. Um, I'll start with uh, Abid Omar to give perspective on uh, this topic uh, from uh, you know, Pakistan perspective, what Pakistan really is doing on air quality. Uh, when I say what Pakistan is really doing on air quality is by that how much, uh, uh, how is the air quality during these lockdowns and what the data shows uh, 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 which, you are, which you are operating. I know you have placed uh, some of the more uh, air quality monitors in some parts of uh, Pakistan as well. Uh, what is uh, update on that, and uh, in relation with health, what you have to say on this? Over to you, Abin. Thank you so much, um, Mariam, and to the SDPI for having me as part of this conference to speak about um, Pakistan's air pollution problems. Um, in this session, I'll be speaking a lot more about solutions, but um, without data, it is uh, difficult to talk about, you know where we stand today. Uh, would you be able to uh, enable my screen sharing, please? I think it is enabled already, is it? It is not. Oh, it is now. Um, so is my screen visible now? Um, so yeah, I, I hope you can uh, see the screen right now. Uh, the topic is, of course, uh, air pollution, COVID-19, what the impacts are during uh, COVID-19, and a little bit about uh, uh, health impacts of air pollution. Um, 
it is one of the things that have come forth recently in uh, research that has been coming up in the past uh, few months since the pandemic has started that one of the primary vectors of transmission of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is uh, airborne transmission. Um, in places like Pakistan, which have very elevated levels of uh, air pollution, of particulate matter, uh, the expectation is that um, you would be much more susceptible to, the, uh, to this virus. Um, there is a conception that Pakistan, though, has been very lucky. And in spite of the very high levels of air pollution, the pandemic is not as bad in Pakistan mm -hmm. as it is in some other parts of the world. Um, However, uh, when you look here at the chart on the left, you will see even though that the daily uh, new confirmed COVID cases in Pakistan are much lower than uh, many other parts of the world, you will see on the right is uh, perhaps a more important chart is the case fatality rate that um, the 2% case fatality rate in Pakistan is very similar to the global average. In fact, it is uh, even slightly higher than the fatality rate in the United States. Mm -hmm. So um, the picture for the pandemic is not as rosy as it may appear too in the media or even uh, while living here. COVID is a very serious crisis. Uh, how much of a role does the air pollution levels uh, have to play in Pakistan? Um, we don't know today because we don't have enough research. And in fact, th that is also one of the key solutions that we have to air pollution is that we need a lot more research in um, places where not much has been done. Um, one of the things uh, that we did see when the pandemics uh, hit Pakistan and we went under lockdown is that the air pollution levels are significantly increased. Uh, here is a picture from the same spot on the same street in Lahore on the left and the, and the right. You can see a huge impact in pollution levels. In fact, there were also some studies done. This is by the Center for Research on Energy and Clean Air. Where on the left, you see before lockdown. On the right, you see after lockdown that there was a massive drop in nitrogen dioxide levels. Uh, however, when you zoom in and you look at Lahore, it is still a red spot. And uh, again, a deeper dive in the data shows that in spite of this dramatic reduction in NOx levels, uh, in PM 2.5 levels, the air pollution still remained well above safe limits, even during the lockdown. So um, that is when there was hardly any economic activity. There was hardly any uh, traffic emissions. Uh, much of the industry was shut down. So there are still very elevated levels of pollution. This is likely to do with that there is certain economic activity, essential industries, essential transportation, uh, power plants, um, steel furnaces, which uh, are never turned off, that the pollution has uh, continued. So Pakistan, even during the lockdown, had levels of pollution well above uh, WHO standards. Um, and looking at a slightly, uh, well, a longer term view from 1st January till 12th December 2020, what the US consulate has to report is that the average PM 2.5 levels in uh, Lahore were 97. Uh, that's 10 times above safe limits. Um, uh, these picture is exactly the same whether you look at Islamabad or Karachi or Peshawar or other cities. Um, we are in no city below um, within safe limits. Um, 41 days in Lahore did meet uh, the 24 hour safe limit standard, which is a 25 microgram per cubic meter concentration. The blue line here shows 2020, the gray line in the background shows uh, 2019, and you will see very similar levels of air pollution. Um, let's see what uh, has been reported for the same city by the Environmental Protection Department of Punjab. And well, 
there's a lot of missing data in uh, what is being reported out of uh, the government's monitoring initiative, but whatever data that we do have, we know that it is seven times above safe limits as reported um, by the EPD's various monitoring station in Lahore. Again, in Islamabad, the picture is quite uh, similar. It's not seven times, but it's at least three, four times above safe limits. Um, and, and that is one of the big issues with air pollution is that one needs data, um, which is what the Open Air Quality Initiative, um, which is a, a NGO based out of the US working on making air quality data open and accessible to the public, to scientists and to pol policy makers, that you need physical data, it has to be station specific, you need coordinates, it has to be real near real time, and it has to be accessible programmatically. Um, in Pakistan, data is not only not available in those uh, formats. Uh, when you look at the data itself, uh, you often see very questionable values, such as um, this one that I've highlighted on the right uh, with the PM 2.5 reported at 2.6 um, microgram, which is an unbelievable concentration for the daily average when on the same day, the US consulate is reporting something 15 times uh, higher. So the reliability of the data is questionable, but th that is not the key point here. The key message is that Pakistan needs a lot of efforts to improve its monitoring. Um, so yeah, 71 days uh, met Punjab's environmental quality st uh, standards for upper uh, safe limit of ambient air to date in 2020. That is uh, not a very good number, especially when you look at what the overall annual average is. Um, so yeah, that being said, perhaps air quality is a big success story in Pakistan. Uh, last November, Prime Minister Imran Khan announced a number of initiatives from improving fuel quality, uh, from having an electrical vehicle policy, upgrading brick kilns, uh, and so forth. Um, and in fact, uh, as of uh, this year, a lot of those policies have uh, come into place. Um, just last uh, week, last Saturday, there was a new announcement, no new coal power projects, 60% renewables by 2030, 30% of uh, vehicles to be shifted to uh, electric vehicles. So these are some amazing um, policies that have been announced uh, and that are uh, partially even executed. And um, we have to see what the results will be because um, blue skies and clean air are a barometer of good governance. Um, the results of the policies so far we've seen as far as the data goes is that much of Punjab still has hazardous air pollution. So uh, the, the policies might be there, but the government governance, the capacity building, the execution uh, needs to be worked on. We can look to our neighbors to see how to clean the air. Uh, we could look at China, um, which is a big international uh, success story. And um, I will not go into all the points uh, mentioned here because I think they're beyond the scope of this uh, short presentation. But uh, what China has done has shown that in, in a um, rapidly growing economy, it is possible to have clean air by implementing certain policies, uh, which uh, Pakistan in many ways has already announced. It's rather a question of how we execute them. Um, so to sum up, these are the four uh, policy areas to work on, uh, industry, agricultural, transportation, and urban waste all supported by the fifth area of uh, monitoring. And briefly, some of these were mentioned that industrial emissions need to be checked uh, and controlled. Um, agriculture, uh, where, where we often talk about crop burning, that needs to be uh, addressed. Uh, we need to shift towards more regenerative agricultural practices. These are all uh, long-term issues. Uh, what should also be highlighted is that the peak pollution levels in Pakistan take place at the end of December and early January, which is well beyond the crop burning uh, session. So while crop burning is a key issue in November, there are all these other emissions which probably need to be addressed first, such as the uh, 
transportation sector, urban waste. Um, uh, a lot of our cities do not have proper urban waste management uh, programs. Uh, urban waste is often burned within the city limits. It is not properly disposed of. Um, and uh, transportation, we already talked about that the emission standards are there. Uh, we are missing in policy our health checks for inspection and maintenance uh, to, you know, to, to check what the emissions are. Uh, we don't have public transportation in our cities. Uh, we have a lot of cargo that goes by diesel trucks rather than by train or by uh, pipeline. Um, and the foundation again is uh, monitoring. We need a nationwide air quality monitoring uh, network. There has been efforts at implementing that. Um, we also need to do a lot of research around that. Uh, in fact, I spoke about this uh, in 2018 at the same conference that we need emissions inventory, we need source apportionment studies, we need health impact studies. And uh, three years later, none of those exist. Um, so we need to empower uh, not just the government, we need to work with universities, uh, researchers, NGOs to get all of those uh, things in place. Um, education on air pollution um, uh, for, for these institutes as well as, well as for the common man. Um, perhaps number three here is a more ambitious uh, target, establishment of emission control zones in some of our major cities. Um, capacity building through the EPA. Again, policies are there. We just need the right governance to implement all of that. And to conclude um, the linkages with COVID, this is a health issue. 135,000 deaths every year attributed to ambient air pollution in Pakistan. To put that in as a scale of reference, just around six, 7,000 deaths this year have been attributed to the pandemic. So um, the amount of resources that are going in towards addressing the pandemic, if we can just put a certain portion of that towards air pollution, Pakistan will be progressing uh, incredibly rapidly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abid, for uh, taking us uh, kind of tour to Pakistan air quality. Um, it is very surprising to see that 2.2% uh, mortality rate is worldwide and Pakistan is close to that, which is 2%. Which is and uh, very well highlighted that we need policy interventions in areas of industry, agriculture, transportation, and urban waste. Uh, but first of all, of course, we need monitoring. And for that, we need more research and more data uh, for uh, policy formulation. Now I would move on to uh, Ms. Bharati. Uh, she will take us to India uh, on this air pollution, and uh, she will also give a bit uh, perspective uh, in Asian air quality and how it is attributing to that during COVID-19. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mariam, and thank you, SDPI. It's such a pleasure to be back, uh, I think, for the third or fourth time. Um, so I uh, just want to take a moment to... Uh, request you to play my PowerPoint because I'm I'm on a on a cell phone, so it's hard for me to play it out. Uh, you um, have so if we can get to the first slide and meanwhile, just um, I thought it was really really important what uh, Abid ended his presentation with, which was if we actually put some of those resources uh, that we're putting into fighting the pandemic, if we fought air pollution in the same way we would really have very different lives um, across South Asia today. We would be breathing different air and we would have very, very different lifestyles. So essentially uh, what I'm going to speak about uh, is the presentation running? No, I don't see it. Um, so essentially what I'm gonna really talk about is really um, some of the ideas um, that, that are required as of today. But really, how do we roll them out? Because there is an understanding um, around um, fabulous, uh, around COVID, which is that, oh, this will get over. But the point is, yes, sure, this will get over. But, uh, but uh, what, what then? That, that was great, that slide. We can go to the next slide, yes. Mm -hmm. 
we can go to the next slide uh, okay so the, it guy also opened and i also opened it guy uh, may i request you to please go, yeah. go ahead that. yeah so great so you know we know already uh, some of what uh, what is there we know that uh, what the data is showing but i thought it would be worth still um, you know talking about it that in fact uh, there, there's enough to show that in italy spain france 78% of the COVID-19 uh, deaths were really in these highly polluted uh, areas. And in fact, uh, the European Society for Cardiology pointed out that uh, we actually have something like 15% uh, of the deaths are entirely due to, uh, uh, can be, con uh, you know, can be linked with air pollution. And we can go to the next slide. Uh, similarly, Harvard did a really um, um, a very similar study, and Beijing did the Beijing University did a really similar study. What was interesting was that they found out that um, the two or three things that stand out from all these studies. One of them is that um, that basically there's a link. It may not be a cause and effect, but definitely long-term exposure. Um, and many of us tend to talk about air pollution as, you know, we get really interested or public opinion is really mobilized and action is really mobilized in the winter in South Asia, because that's when there's inversion and you can actually see a worse quality air. But in fact, throughout the year, uh, uh, you know, we have different parts of uh, India and different parts of South Asia have uh, quite bad quality air that doesn't meet the national or, of course, not the WHO standards. So the point is that they're talking about long-term exposure. The second interesting thing is they're talking about uh, NOxes, nitrogen oxides. And these are, they're talking about those kinds of uh, uh, pollutants, uh, many of these studies. Next, please. So we're looking at, uh, at this. Now, if you really look at this, I looked at IQ Air. Uh, I mean, they're very, you can look at a bunch of things, but uh, if you look at this, I found this fascinating because um, I've only put the top 17 uh, countries, but if you look at them, they're just two in China. Otherwise, they're in India, they're in Pakistan. And if you go lower, number 21 is in Bangladesh. So essentially what we're trying to, what we need to point out is that if each of these are number one, these are cities. Uh, number two, we just have really bad, uh, um, you know, air in our cities. And it seems that we have some of the worst air in the world in the northern part of the subcontinent, which is the Gangetic Belt and above, if you look at this. Next, please. But what this doesn't tell you, and this is really important, is what is so specific about South Asia. And I think it's important to dwell on this because we too often we forget our very specific kinds of uh, challenges. Uh, first of all, I think it's what people do because we have a huge number of informal sector. In fact, in India, uh, you know, 93% of all jobs are in the, in the informal sector. And that goes even outside agriculture, it goes uh, to cities. So you, whether you have construction workers, whether you have vendors, whether you have waste workers, Many of these people's workplaces are in the open. And so we're talking about a huge number of people uh, who are facing exposure on a daily basis, but they have to because there's the element of poverty. And um, many of these people uh, um, have to, are, daily, uh, are daily earners, so to say, since they're not wagers, they don't get wages. So our specific context is we're dealing with um, air pollution as it sits on the crossroads of livelihoods for the poor, as well as safeguarding their health. Apart from that, of course, there's the issue of health equity. We have poor health infrastructure. We uh, obviously, housing is a huge issue uh, across South Asia. Significant populations live in slums, anywhere between 40 and 60%, depending on the particular city and its history. So we don't even have adequate uh, housing and so there are far more vulnerable the vulnerability of the poor is far greater um, to uh, south asia for in south asia for example we find that uh, when you're cooking for example 
you uh, you have no ventilation if you're living in a little a little kind of slum sometimes made of cardboard sometimes put together with bricks uh, barely any ventilation so you're hugely enhancing the air pollution at home uh, you're bringing home all the pollutants on your clothes if you're for example a painter who's uh, you know got all the paint particles on their clothing um, because they'll come home uh, too often they'll come home and change or industrial workers so uh, those are our specific uh, things let's go to the next slide actually the slide after that so what do we do about that i think the first thing uh, that i want to point out um, is about our recent past um, or rather our past of this century and why i'm saying this is there's there's also this murmur about um, when you talk about how air pollution has you know um exacerbated the impact of covid too often you're told that uh, you know air pollution was there before covid and air pollution will continue after covid um and uh, so while air pollution in itself should be handled um we shouldn't really think about pandemics and air pollution and i really want to point out that that is kind of uh, misleading and i think that is a wrong and unstrategic approach and if you look at this slide what's interesting about it is i didn't obviously put covid because even right now we're in the middle of covid and as arbit said it's a it's really very serious we have a 1.5% mortality rate in india and that's it's not a joke i mean we have 25 27000 approximately new cases in the last 24 hours so i mean there are going to be lives lost uh, and every life um, is valuable so if you look at this slide uh, you're going to see that um, while ebola was not a pandemic it was still a cause of great concern it was in five western countries but we've had sars we've had h1n1 so it seems like this looks like a century of more frequent pa pandemics than we seem to realize um, and if we can go to the next slide you might notice that uh, they both uh, kind of are respiratory system illnesses now uh, i put this quote in because uh, i thought it was so telling that even the who says that uh, you know changes in the way humanity inhabits the planet make the emergence of you know more new diseases inevitable and i think we should just know this and uh, live with this uh, and prepare for it next slide please so um, not only do we uh, uh, need to prepare for it but i think it's quite important to realize that clean air is a form of being prepared so for example uh, and we'll go to the next slide um, not only do we need to reduce our vulnerability to these illnesses we just need to reduce the number of deaths from air pollution i mean um itself 100000 deaths in india every single month so i thought i'd share this data about air pollution and really the break up now before i get to this it's quite i just wanted to share that uh, that um this is just an aggregate and one of my favorite uh, sites is urban emissions and they just looked at all these 122 cities because we've got the national clean air plan it uh, was launched in 2018 and it was modified then a uh, little bit later and uh, we've tried to understand what really contributes to air pollution and it's not a surprise at all 11% is waste management there's industry including power generation and there's transport um and of course there's road dust management which is generally quite a vague thing to say because it's multi sourced in so many different ways um mind boggling ways so we could go to the next one um and what i really liked about uh, uh about this was the the point about data now this is just the case of bhopal i just put it here because i think if we if we assume that every city is similar then we're not going to really tackle those kinds of problems now uh we've got bhopal and it's got kind of numbers which are a little bit different it actually has a, a brick kiln issue 
and it and 41 percent of its pollution actually seems to be coming outside the urban airshed so i think uh, we we need to kind of look can we go to the next slide uh, we we can kind of need to really disaggregate the data and look at it and i can't emphasize that enough because otherwise we don't solve that problem i put this in because i you know we've got all these data about all these studies and uh, i mean some of you might be familiar with this but every single one of these on the urban emission sites you can download them and you get a really brilliant snapshot uh, if you don't have the time to read everything on what's happening in that city and uh, I, to me data like this is really a gold mine because it tells you where you have the maximum 2.5 what you need to act on, what you can let be. So it actually guides your strategy. So we'll go to the next one and uh, the one after this, please. So, you know, the last few slides, really, I want to talk about what do we do about air pollution? And too often, in, even in air pollution, we focus on clinical interventions at the city level. And we're like, we're going to put better asthma clinics. We're going to uh, you know, be able to tell people how to predict, um, you know, when they're not going to breathe well. But I really think that uh, that apart from the usual mitigation of the key resource, the key sources, I think we really need to do two or three things which we don't do well enough. One of them is the strategic public-private partnership. I mean, Abid's a great example of that. And uh, we have our own... Um, own cases in India. I mean, Ronak Sataria was also a partner. I know of Abid would be one case. There's urban emissions itself, which is putting out uh, fabulous data in the public realm. And we really have to measure better. Can we go to the next one? I've put out uh, four priorities here um, for us to think about. Uh, mobility, I believe, is our biggest ally to fight future pandemics, particularly in South Asia, because not only are cities like Bangladesh really, really uh, rapidly urbanization, uh, urbanizing, and they have urbanized, but even Pakistan and India are on the same route. And we have six of the world's 29 mega cities, which means that we, we are faced with a mobility challenge as a region. And uh, because mobility is one of the biggest urban challenges and transportation, as we see in the data, is actually one of the biggest contributors to air pollution. So we could do the next one. Um, sorry, I should have added there that our biggest challenges in India is how to enhance our, uh, our mobility and make it make the private mobility uh, reducingly non-motor, I mean, increasingly non-motorized, but also put more and more public transport because, uh, because there are greater needs. There's a greater reason to push the middle class into public transport. And after the pandemic, we found a large number of people uh, from uh, wealthy people, people who would normally drive, deciding to cycle. And what was really interesting about that was that they bought these really expensive uh, cycles and then they were struggling to cycle but they cycled and it sort of became a fashion for a while and that's now um, ebbing away but uh, there have been those kinds of moves and it's important to push beyond that so we'll quickly go to industries and industries including uh, including things like uh, power generation are absolutely vital. And if you look at the data, you'll find, for example, even Delhi, and I'm using Delhi again and again, but um, Delhi is actually surrounded by a bunch of uh, uh, coal-based thermal plants and that contributes to the air pollution. And one of the knee-jerk reactions we often see from planners in this part of the world is, oh, move it out, it's really polluting. The courts are saying, move out these industries. But wherever you're moving them out is also a place. And so you really have to look at clean production and clean processes and cost should not be an argument. And I think that is one lesson, policy lesson for the pandemic, from the pandemic, that cost should not be a lesson because the cost of human lives lost is much greater. Let's go to the next one. I wanted to uh, spend a few moments talking about waste. Uh, 
40% of the world's waste is burnt. So you can pretty much imagine that we're basically breathing the trash that we throw out as a global community. But it's also a very underestimated, um, uh, you know, contributor to air pollution. Uh, for example, in Delhi, we did this study a few years ago, there are 30,000 small fires lit every single night by security from November to February, because around one o'clock it's freezing cold. And security, uh, which means security guards, will pick up twigs and pieces of plastic and burn that. And so you actually have all these localized forms of uh, air pollution, and we don't tend to uh, count them in when we're looking at solutions or even challenges. And these are very local things. In other parts of the world, you don't have security uh, outside private uh, offices and homes, and you don't have them sitting in courts and uh, so on and so forth. So we really need to uh, look at that. And finally, uh, the hidden sources. Too often we don't talk about construction, uh, construction debris, because when, you know, there's, it's really uh, inadequately uh, recycled globally, uh, but I mean, in South Asia, and it sits there when it's dumped. And every time there's breeze, you have these, this particulate matter moving in. Whereas actually it's one of the easiest technologies. And in India, we found that you can actually quite easily recycle it. The challenges were first standards, then there were standards made, and then it was really marketing. So it's really not so complex if we actually um, are able to put that into place. And e-waste is another really big challenge because e-waste, which is poorly recycled, has a huge role in socks, um, um, as well as, of course, uh, other kinds of heavy metals. Let's go to the next slide. And I, I really love this quote from Christine Wiedenmeyer, who's from NCAR in Boulder. And she did this amazing study where she looked at waste all over the world. And she says, you know, 29% of the global anthropogenic emissions of small particulate matter come from trash fires. Of course, uh, this is a global number. Um, India numbers show 11%. But like I said, uh, what, what comprises trash? And we need to... We need to be able to get the signatures better and understand these problems better. But again, she talks of mercury. And too often, we talk about particulate size, which is very, very important, 2.5. But then there's also the chemical component of it. And for sure, if there's mercury and there's pHs, we need to worry about them, also about what they will do to the bodies, particularly of young people. We'll go to the next slide. And I think Abid's already said a lot of that really eloquently, but I cannot emphasize enough the importance of putting that information out in the public. And um, if you don't put that information in a appropriate way in the public, it's not just that go on the pollution control um, or the EPA website. There has to be ways to make that information accessible. For example, uh, one of the things that's happening in India is that people are giving out that data to schools via WhatsApp so that the school can, and these are small micro initiatives, but can the schools just not have outdoor games or sports or whatever they do, the physical training on a day when it's 300 outside. So there's all kinds of ways to make that information public, but public, we must make it. Otherwise, the people are not going to be able to protect themselves. And this is not something the government can do alone. Uh, it's too big a problem. Let's go to, um, uh, to uh, my final slide, where I really want to say that we, we should focus not just on particles, but also on people. Because uh, too often, uh, and I'll give you a, an example that, that uh, happened a couple of years ago. Too often, these, pl these plastic recyclers, uh, Delhi used to be one of the biggest hubs in South Asia for plastic reprocessing. And the, they were asked to move out because they were contributing to air pollution. But if you looked at that data, there was none, and it was anecdotal. And when we started actually breaking up those uh, cause and effect, we realized that the real problem was that the, they were all in an industrial area, 
where the roads, where the road dust was so high because it was used uh, as a thoroughfare by heavy vehicles and commercial vehicles. Um, and those were actually contributors, whereas plastic recycling, which was actually a livelihood of uh, the urban poor, and in fact, uh, uh, very vital to a city metabolizing its waste was thrown out, but the air pollution never got reduced. And so I believe that we need to really look at uh, inclusive and equitable models of uh, solving the problem because that is the way that we, uh, because these are the most vulnerable people even in a pandemic. So let's not double their vulnerability and increase it by the wrong kinds of prescriptions or rather by exclusive kinds of prescriptions. Um, and I have a couple of uh, examples here about construction site norms, uh, not just about materials, but also about people, but I will end here and thank you very much. Thank you, Bharati, for a very comprehensive presentation and uh, uh, very well uh, concluded that focus just not on particles, but on people because health is very important. And uh, to uh, surprisingly, which is not a new thing, but uh, we have been talking about that major contributor uh, to air pollution. Uh, you just highlighted in, in India as so well, it is first industry, second is transportation, and third comes waste. And here in Pakistan as well, uh, uh, case, case is similar, um, uh, but we, we are targeting uh, farmers and break ins because uh, uh, those are soft targets and we don't go to industry and transportation. Although we do have policy, but let's see what it takes uh, for its implementation. And we will talk about it with uh, Dr. Farzana uh, uh, after Gabriel. Uh, so Professor Gabriel, I'll now come to you. Uh, you have heard, uh, uh, Bharati has given picture of uh, almost whole Asia and then Abid has covered a point uh, also globally some points and particularly focus on Pakistan and both have given some way forward. So what is the situation in developed world? Uh, uh, you're based in USA and uh, there were protests going on, uh, which, which were spreading COVID, protesters, protests and uh, jalsas are also going on gatherings and sit-ins in Pakistan as well uh, by opposition parties. That also spread COVID-19, but uh, air pollution is also a major contributing factor. Uh, what, was, uh, what was the situation of industry during lockdowns in USA because uh, 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 your president Donald Trump don't really believe in uh, climate change. So uh, what industries close over there? What was the situation and what was the air quality and how health was impacted uh, over there? Over to you. Great, thanks so much, Ms. Mariam. And, and uh, Mr. Abid and uh, Ms. Bharati, I think set this uh, conversation up beautifully. Um, and, and, and first, before I dive into the US and then I'm gonna expand again, I, I do wanna pick up on something that Ms. Barati said, which is that I know it's hard to, uh, to grapple with this when we're in the middle of this pandemic, but this will not be the last one that we will see this century, certainly not. Because all of the same environmental drivers that allowed a, a zoonotic disease, so a animal to human transfer disease to occur in the first place, which are largely environmental and climate change, they all still exist. And they'll continue to exist in this century. Not only that, but the drivers that allowed a single zoonotic disease to then uh, infect large populations and spread across the globe will also continue this century. So um, we need to be aware of the ingredients that, that make, that spark pandemics, um, and we need to get uh, ahead of them. No, even our best efforts uh, to control diseases, to keep them as, uh, as local diseases or epidemics instead of pandemics can be really challenging. And, and uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes the COVID disease is, an, is uh, completely unique to our experience, at least. It's amazing transmissibility between pe from people to people, right? We rarely see anything quite like that. Uh, but that doesn't mean it'll be the only time that we'll see that. Um, and so I think we have to keep that in the back of our minds, although it's depressing to think about facing more global pandemics. Um, it's not, this is not a unique one, nor will, as I mentioned, will it be the last one we see. So 
But back to back to COVID air quality and health, I think rarely do you see a situation where you can see the interactions between the environment, our actions and our health so intricately enmeshed, right? Not only from, as I mentioned, the, the spark for this pandemic, uh, which was the environmental destruction and, and zoonotic transfer of this disease, but also the populations that are most vulnerable. And I think um, Abid and, uh, and Ms. Barati, I think, uh, laid that out quite well. But uh, to get a little bit to the physiology of this before then I bring up a couple of US examples. Uh, the, one of the reasons why there's that vulnerability is this particular virus causes this, uh, these cytokine streams, uh, cytokine storm. So it, when it attacks our body, when it starts lodging in our airways, um, it, like all viruses, um, infects the uh, cell and, and produces more of itself, right? That's how viruses can work. But this particular one um, is so active that it sends up this, this inflammatory response. So our body just fights against itself. And that's when you get the most severe cases of uh, COVID. So uh, in a nutshell, we know how why air quality, bad air quality causes asthma reactions, right? It, it enhances this inflammatory response in the upper airways. The little bit difference here with, with, uh, with COVID is that it, it's a whole airway system. So it's not just the upper bronchias, which is where the asthma is, but these, air, these particulates that have been laid out by, uh, by Abid and Barati, as well as other irritants like nitrogen dioxide, which I think I'll, I'll focus on most during the rest of this, uh, preset our lungs for this inflammatory response. Not everybody's lungs, certainly, but presets a, a, a sector of the population. So uh, by getting ahead of this via better air quality controls, we will, as has been laid out by our previous two speakers, will in, in effect be able to solve some of the, of the uh, disease course already, right? It won't stop this from being transmitted except for the role of air particulates on transmission of, of uh, this virus person to person, but it certainly will make it less, uh, less deadly in a sense. So let me go back, let me come uh, zoom in on our own work here in the US. Um, we, like everybody else uh, across the world, uh, found a significant reduction in a number of uh, what we call criteria air pollutants uh, during uh, the, the, grip, the full grip of our lockdowns, our shutdowns. So for here in the US, it was uh, March, April, and uh, in some states it extended all the way through the first half of May of this year. Granted, our general um, air quality is um, frankly significantly better than it is in Pakistan and, and most of Southeast Asia, largely because of the contr emission controls that we have in place. Uh, nevertheless, we did also saw a significant uh, reduction in air pollution. So our work focused on 12 US cities and it all showed a pretty uniform uh, drop of between 20 to 45 or 50% of, uh, of NO2, so nitrogen dioxide. And the drop in PM 2.5 was not quite as consistent across sectors, uh, but it was for NO2. And one of the reasons why we were able to, to identify the NO2 drop is, uh, I think uh, Mr. Abid mentioned this, uh, that uh, not all industries shut down when there was a shutdown, right? Uh, they, electricity still had to be produced uh, and so forth. But um, what, it, what the biggest uh, factor that drove that 40% drop was local vehicular emissions. So it was people not commuting to work on, in their personal vehicles, um, buses, not, uh, bus systems and mass transportation uh, schedules being reduced significantly. Uh, and um, to some extent, uh, tr uh, transportation, uh, like trucking and trains being reduced. So um, local re reduction by personal action. So I I'm calling this uh, the shutdown uh, in improvements in air quality personal action, right? Um, uh, they achieved about a 40% uh, improvement in air quality, which is phenomenal, right? It shows people how much our own actions control our own local environment and thus can then control our own health. However, I, I would be remiss in not noting that that 40% misses another 60% that still went on, right? 60% of this air quality uh, production, uh, production of, of NO2 at least, 
uh, still continue to pace, even with an, an absolute shutdown of our, our, uh, our, at least in the US, our national economies. Uh, and so that speaks a little bit to the fact that as individuals, we have some control over our local environment, but as both previous speakers said, it's really, tr we need to transform entire systems, right? We need to transform the way we produce electricity. We need to transform the way uh, we travel within cities, maybe permanently so. Mr. Abid mentioned uh, um, traffic control issues in, in major cities. Uh, and and as, as I think many of you know, I did spend two weeks in Pakistan last year, 2019, talking about air quality and health. And you know, I observed all of the same issues that you've all brought up, uh, which is a lot of um, low quality fuel being burned, a lot of uh, the, the local vehicles and don't have much in the way of emission, emission control or any, as well as a significant amount of urban waste being burned. Right, those are all the classic uh, classic examples of air quality uh, pollution. Now, it's striking, I think, that in the U.S., that almost all of those shutdowns had to be driven by uh, individual actions of each 50 states that we have in this country. Each each of the 50 states had a different schedule for lockdown because we are abs we have absolutely no federal leadership on on uh, the pandemic, uh, at least on ways to control people. Uh, it, it transmitting in the population. And of course, no really national dialogue on air quality improvement. In fact, our air quality standards have, have declined in the last four years because of this administration. Uh, they've, they've done everything they can to remove controls. Uh, thankfully, uh, that we can look forward to a, a better future for our country as well as better international diplomacy come January 20th, 2021. Uh, where we will re-engage on things like the Paris Climate Accord. But um, we have to think about, uh, about in, in terms of our own solutions, the only reason why we, we, um, we have such good air quality in general in the U.S. is because, as Mr. Abid said, we have mon active monitoring that's quite dependable and quite public. Uh, we have that monitoring drive local action. In this case, um, uh, the first real local action was in California, where uh, the pollution was so bad in some major cities like Los Angeles that the state implemented their own emission control standards for vehicles. Um, and once they implemented this emission controls standard, it meant that no vehicle could be sold in the state of California unless they met this criteria, which effectively meant that all vehicles produced in the U.S. had to meet that criteria because uh, California is such a big market for cars. And so um, we, it's not like we've, we always have had a great history of national leadership on some of these issues. Sometimes individual states have to, have to drive this. But the, the reason why California was able to do this is, uh, as Mr. Abid said, it was able to develop uh, public-private partnerships. So it was able to engage universities to help with monitoring. It was able to engage local municipalities to improve and set up uh, emission control standards. Uh, it was able to work with the government of California to require your vehicle to be clean every two years before you can reg legally register that vehicle to drive, right? So is this public-private partnerships that have at least been one recipe for success on air quality in the US. And, and the example from China was brought up, well, they have the luxury of not having to have those public-private partnerships to, uh, to make ad ad advances in some of these air control standards, right? The government can make it so, and, um, and it will be so. Uh, I think in, in uh, Pakistan and in India, Southeast Asia, and certainly US, we really have to rely on those. And I'm gonna just kind of conclude this with, uh, with reflecting a little bit on my time in Pakistan. And what I noted was that, um, as I think Mr. Abid and Ms. Bharati pointed out, we, you know, in Southeast Asia, you know most of the emission sources for air particulates. Uh, and you know most of the emission sources for NO2 and ozone and other, of these, uh, these criteria air pollutants that are, take such a burden on, on public health there. So you know the sources. There's policies in place, at least theoretically, to control those sources and improve health. And of course, you need to take the knowledge, the policies, and then turn them into action. And that action is always the most challenging step. I'll just tell you that it really is, because that's where people have to go stop going from talking to start doing, and that usually means money being placed to these things that usually means a little bit more governmental control. It's certainly possible, and I saw amazing capacity in Pakistan 
uh, to dialogue across the federal agencies and universities and local communities. But um, I would urge, urge you to continue doing that because uh, the next pandemic sadly will come and it very well might also be a respiratory pandemic. And it very well might also be partially solved, hopefully by improving uh, air quality there. So uh, thank you very much for your attention and uh, looking forward to the rest of the panel. Thank you, Professor uh, Gabriel, for your interventions and very well mentioned that and highlighted that our individual actions uh, also uh, lead to, you know, improve uh, a bit of local environment uh, because every little step is uh, very important. Um, now, uh, uh, I would request uh, Ms. Farzana Da, uh, who is Director General, uh, Federal Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, but before uh, before that, uh, let me also acknowledge the uh, presence of our executive director, Dr. Abid Kayum Suleri, uh, who was uh, sitting in this session throughout. Uh, thank you so much for that. And uh, Ms. Perzana, you have heard all the speakers. Uh, Abid highlighted that uh, uh, there is a need for policy interventions in industry, agriculture, transportation, urban waste and of course monitoring. And uh, he also raised some concern on availability of data, which was missing uh, on the government side. Uh, on government side. And uh, then uh, I want to raise uh, uh, one of the point here is that uh, there was uh, this launch of clean and green index, uh, I think in previous month in which uh, uh, there were uh, uh, cities were given ranking and among top five cities, it was uh, Rawalpindi and as well as Lahore to my surprise that they are doing better uh, in this, uh, according to this index. And it also has component of uh, air quality. So if, if data is missing, data is not there, how uh, that uh, ranking was really there and how Lahore was one of the cleanest cities. And uh, also uh, I would like to know that uh, what government is doing uh, regarding uh, data provision and uh, because uh, provision of data to the public is that that's what we are emphasizing from past two years on different sessions where Abid is always invited and I always drive Bharati in, in that as well. Um, and why we always, uh, you know, uh, make target to farmers and break -ins, uh, although those uh, also contribute to uh, uh, bad air quality, but it is uh, industry and transportation. Why don't we go there uh, where a lot of policy intervention and actions are needed? Uh, over to you. I think I have uh, asked a, a list of quite tough questions, but uh, you are better to handle. Uh, Ms. Farzana, I, I think there is some uh, issue with your audio. We can't hear you. Uh, it's, uh, you're still not audible. Oh, is it okay? Yes, now you're audible. Uh, actually, a lot of the people are sitting around here with me and thank you so much, uh, Mariam, Dr. Abed and Gabriel, how are you? And uh, Bharti uh, Chaturvedi, uh, good evening to everyone. And it was a great pleasure to participate with all, uh, all of you. And I will share, first of all, uh, I'm sitting right now in our industry. Uh, so around uh, me, more than 10 people are listening all these presentations and uh, we are making discussion on this subject. Uh, you, Mariam, you have put a lot of the question to me. First of all, I will go what has been suggested by the Gabriel about the policy. Uh, because uh, policy is the uh, Bible which gives us the directions for the development in any particular direction. And do we have adopted any specific policy about the pollution and the health is a prime question. And in this present situation of the pandemic or COVID-19, uh, still we have to evolve the policy about it. And uh, a few days back, I was having a discussion with uh, some survey people uh, regarding uh, what are our way forward. So uh, I think pollution is an issue with which third world countries are developing countries and like country Pakistan and uh, India are dealing since uh, decades. 
and still uh, there is no clear policy about in such disaster about the issue of the uh, health uh, problems related to the air quality so uh, this is the time again we should uh, start thinking about uh, having clear policy about our approaches and to develop proper program and the strategies uh, rightly said by you sometimes we do talk in the season of the winter uh, about more air pollution and targeting uh, farmers for the burning of the waste and uh, about the uh, brick kilns issue in uh, twin countries our uh, twin punjab concept which we evolved from last few years indian punjab and pakistan punjab but overall uh, the issue remains throughout the year because we have all type of weather in our countries so accordingly we have to have the holistic approach for uh, uh, addressing all these issues i will more focus towards the present data and its linkages with the health issues in pakistan or throughout the world or southeast asia and then our uh, approaches toward these data analysis as mentioned by avid umar that about 135000 deaths per year are occurring due to the air pollution still i don't buy this argument uh, because uh, Uh, already mentioned by all of my fellows we don't have the persistent continuous regular reliable and transparent data about the air quality and uh, based on that air quality data its linkages with the health is one of the major challenge for all of us uh, continuous monitoring approach for the people who are facing some acute health issues because of the air pollution is one of the major challenge and uh, still Uh, we don't have the scientific evidence very clearly still we are working a lot in this present scenario uh, about the uh, increase of the uh, patients in terms of the airborne infections either it's a suspended particulate matter carrying some microorganisms or other viruses with them uh, because usually we correlate and due to our level of awareness in our communities we correlate these issues with the uh, Uh, weather conditions cold or cough or sometimes of activities uh, we relate them mostly with uh, our weather conditions or rain or such type of uh, scenarios instead of uh, understanding uh, what type of infections are being carried by the aerosols and uh, one of the professor elizabeth in the whirlpool university is doing research about it uh, uh, air borne infections because of the microorganisms and my emphasis is more about this uh, when i although we don't have very clear data about the air quality and persistent data but uh, about the particular matter 2.5 as mentioned by the abit during this pandemic situation remained within the who limit and our national environmental quality standard below the 35 microgram per cubic meter but still a lot of the people were suffering and use of the mask in this scenario has protected uh many uh, great number of the population from lot of the infection so um, in this uh, situation uh we need to link and we need to establish a surveillance system uh, where we can link our health issues with the clearly airborne infections or infections because of the pollution and especially when we talk about the smoke in twin punjab uh we cannot exactly correlate Uh, our load on the hospitals in this scenario uh, as far as uh, source of the air pollutions are concerned um, rightly mentioned by avid about the present initiative of our prime minister uh, imran khan about the clean and green uh, pakistan so uh, ministry of climate change in the context of the clean has taken few initiative what does clean mean and then we have to turn into the green so clean water clean air and uh, solid waste burning solid waste management these are the issues which can result ultimately into the clean environment and we can uh, be successful only adopting such practices uh, i will not uh, repeat all those four factors mentioned by the bharti uh, regarding this solid waste burning but this is one of the challenge uh, about the uh, pakistan and india major uh, impacted by this and then our trans boundary air quality movement uh, so uh, ministry of climate change is more focusing and we have developed a clean city index 
where we have targeted several uh, cities of the Punjab uh, included into this uh, clean green index of the prime minister. And this is one of the present most effective tool uh, strategy which we are adopting for clean uh, air in Pakistan. And then uh, government of Sindh is going to participate in it. And uh, already KPK government is going to participate in different provinces for the information of the, my international participants. In Pakistan, different cities have participated in the clean green index uh, competition by the Ministry of Climate Change. And in this way, we are having holistic approach to develop the uh, clean cities and a clean air um, program. And uh, simultaneously, as far as data is concerned, uh, for this purpose, for this forum, I will request all my respected participants and audience that we need to have the collaborative effort for sharing the data and uh, for understanding the data and uh, to collect the data which is presentable. Because without presentable data, we cannot conclude what are the actual issues related to that. And especially where we are exposed to the uh, particulate matter 2.5, the most uh, Concerned uh, parameter uh, presently, at, uh, on the basis of that, we usually determine that uh, air quality index of Pakistan is at what stage and uh, responsible data. Uh, so, who is authorized to present the data in any country or in any citizen is one of the prime concern and which data is reliable. So, with this, I think, uh, Mariam, I have answered to your question and uh, I will not take much time. One more thing I will say about the uh, our climate change policy 2012 and about uh, different adaptation and mitigation approaches in them. So uh, smart uh, agriculture is one of the approach which is uh, countries working on that about the, the solid waste burning by the farmers. And this is one of the major challenge. And in the present situation, uh, we have given some incentive in the, some areas of the South Punjab uh, to farmers for uh, control of their waste burning and similarly introduction of the new technology and Nepal is with Pakistan on this forum for introduction of the new technology for uh, brick kilns and uh, mostly more than um, I think 500 uh, units have been converted in the Punjab with the new six technology and uh, this is one of the major source of the hydrocarbons emission and the particulate matter 2.5 and dispersion is not localized. One more thing, uh, rightly mentioned by Bharti, about there is no vaccine for the air pollution. And simultaneously, Bharti ji, uh, air pollution doesn't need any visa to travel anywhere. So uh, in this scenario, uh, we have to look into the uh, collective approach, uh, transboundary or transprovincial or trans-state issue is really problematic uh, for uh, both uh, the two countries. Uh, because uh, in the especially season of the November, December and January, we blame each other about the uh, situation of the smoke. But exactly, the, uh, I heard by a few of the friends from uh, Mali Declaration Forum, which is a transboundary air quality movement uh, between eight countries. And we have been working from the years on this subject. And we have been able to understand the, what are the impacts on the transboundary air quality movement and how we have to mitigate about this situation. Uh, so, um, this is a real problem and still a long way to go about the air quality and we have to learn the lesson from uh, those countries who have achieved the target, especially we quote the example of the China about the clean Beijing. So, uh, it, it's a time to sit together once again to share the data and we have very clear data about um, this uh, air pollution. Last thing I would like to mention that uh, adversity into the opportunity, uh, which I believe very strongly as an environmentalist. Uh, this uh, pandemic situation has improved the air quality in our cities and a reset button has been done by the nature. So sometimes the uh, nature uh, does response to our wrongdoings. Uh, so we should do the justice to the nature and should play our role uh, honestly. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, uh, Ms. Farzana, for your interventions and for updating us what government is doing. As you mentioned that masks has somehow uh, protected people uh, because uh, from, from bad air quality, but that has also a challenge because uh, uh, there is no mechanism of uh, safe disposal of masks. 
uh, not only in Pakistan, but uh, in India and other South Asian countries as well. I'm not aware, uh, I'm not updated on uh, the safe disposal uh, globally and what is the situation in USA, but uh, in, it, it comes under infectious waste and this also has to be dealt with uh, um, hospital waste protocols. Uh, I'll uh, now move to Dr. Abhik Koyum uh, Let me just take benefit uh, from his presence. And I request him to uh, please conclude this session and uh, um, thank our panelists. Dr. Abhik, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, good morning. Good morning, Bharti. Uh, Good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are based. Uh, Mariam, it, was not, it is not fair. I was here to learn from uh, the wisdom of uh, all the uh, gurus who are here discussing uh, air quality. Uh, I don't know why they put me in this uh, uh, panel. Uh, well, uh, so while I'm here, I just wanted to uh, reiterate uh, what uh, everyone has uh, uh, talked uh, about. And uh, uh, that is we have to take uh, air pollution uh, serious. Uh, we have been taking it as uh, one of the uh, natural uh, manifestation. Uh, it's uh, hazy, it's dusty, uh, it is uh, maybe foggy, etc. But uh, air pollution is something which is not only affecting our uh, health, it is also uh, affecting uh, our economies and it is affecting our uh, social life. Uh, it is disrupting uh, not only uh, the flights, but also it was disrupting uh, uh, the children education uh, in the pre-COVID time uh, when due to smog. Uh, now we know in a new normal, children, they can't go to uh, school uh, due to uh, COVID. But even before COVID, many of the children uh, who were uh, privileged enough to uh, get enrolled in any school, uh, those were out of uh, school for days uh, due to uh, smog and because the quality of air uh, was so uh, unbreathable. Uh, I also uh, feel uh, quite uh, embarrassed to see that uh, uh, Lahore and Delhi and Bombay and Kar Karachi, uh, we are uh, competing for the worst. And when we look at uh, uh, the air quality index, uh, very often we find that uh, it is either uh, the cities of uh, Pakistan or cities of India uh, who are uh, the worst performer vis-a-vis. Uh, uh, air uh, quality. Uh, I think uh, uh, this is uh, an issue, and especially in the context of COVID-19, uh, that uh, requires uh, not only uh, collective wisdom, but also collective action and a regional action uh, when we're talking of especially uh, overcoming air pollution in Lahore and in Chandigarh and Amritsar and uh, Haryana. So unless and until uh, both the countries and both the governments uh, uh, they uh, join their heads together and they come up with the joint action plan uh, to uh, look after how uh, to uh, clean our air and what are the practices, do's and don'ts uh, that can be done or that can't be uh, done. Uh, I don't see uh, any uh, hope for the uh, future. Similarly, India and uh, Nepal, uh, India and Bangladesh. So uh, the bordering uh, with the, our neighbors, uh, we have to uh, talk to uh, uh, following some sort of a bilateral approach, some sort of a regional approach uh, for clean air, uh, which is uh, the right of our uh, future uh, generations. Uh, I will uh, just uh, avail this opportunity to thank uh, the galaxy of panelists here. And uh, I endorse uh, some of the, most of the suggestion that Bharti uh, gave. Uh, I think that is a practical way forward to clean our air for our future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll just take a minute uh, for group photo. Dr. Abed, you have to switch on your video and may I request Ms. Farzana, if she's around to please switch on camera. Yes. Done. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Gabriel, Ms. Bharati, Abed, Ms. Parzana and Dr. Abed for your intervention. Thank you very Bye. much. Thank you everyone for having us.